everyone. Welcome. Everyone, welcome. It's Naomi Wolf, uh, CEO of Daily Cloud. And I'm so excited to be here with Tony Lyons, the president and publisher of Skyhorse Publishing, one of the most important independent um, book publishers today. Uh, welcome, Mr. Lyons. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So specifically, we wanted to talk to you um, because you are the super brave publisher of The Real Anthony Fauci. You also have 10,000 books out, and I believe um, currently about 50 of them are bestsellers. Is that correct? Did I read that correctly? Yeah, I think it's 58, but it's close enough. Fantastic. And that's, I mean, for those who are outside the world of publishing, that's an incredible track record. Um, it's almost impossible. I don't know how you, you do it, not to mention for an independent publisher. So let's talk uh, right now about specifically um, the book, The Real Anthony Fauci uh, by RFK Jr. And it's been joined by a documentary version uh, produced by Jeff Hayes, um, directed by Jeff Hayes. Um, and uh, and that's out now and, and facing various hurdles. Talk to me about the, the journey of bringing that book to the public eye and the impact of the movie. Sure. I mean, it's an incredible story in the sense that, you know, the book, even before publication, was subjected to just every level of censorship possible. So Robert F. Kennedy Jr. had something like a dozen hit pieces written in every major newspaper and magazine. Uh, so one newspaper had six investigative journalists looking into his personal life to try to find anything that they could talk about. And it just so happened that they did that at exactly the point that the book was coming out. So if you believe that's an accident, uh, you know, then then we'll sell you some real estate in South Florida. But, you know, the story here is that you know, hit piece after hit piece simultaneously with the publication, we were not allowed to publicize the book in the sense that no major big tech platform would accept advertising in, in any way at all. I mean, there's so many different ways you can place ads and, and we try to do all of them for as many of our books as we can. And we tried site after site, platform after platform, nobody would accept ads. Even the New York Times refused to accept an advertisement. So this is so fascinating, not that it would happen, which is sadly kind of predictable now, but what did they say to you? Because that is such a shameful, uh, you know, inexcusable thing, especially for the paper of record. What reason did they give? They, they could not run a, a, an advertisement about a public interest book that is thoroughly documented. Sure. So yeah, just to put it into context, the book has 2,194 citations. It's got blurbs from you know, a, a Nobel Prize winning scientist from doctors, and lawyers, and dozens of other scientists. And so what the New York Times said was that the book was misinformation. And so I said, well, let's let's dig down into it. And so we went, you know, there was lots of back and forth. And when they finally rejected the ad, uh, what their final statement was, uh, was just that they're a private company and they can make decisions about what they want to run or or not run. Exactly. So, you know, the same sort of thing happened with their uh, bestseller list. So the New York Times bestseller list has always carried lots of weight in this country. Uh, but more and more, I've been learning that this is not really a bestseller list. This is a recommended reading list. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a curated list that's based on a narrative that they want to tell. So when they don't want to tell the narrative or when they want the narrative to be a little bit different, mm -hmm. they manipulate their own bestseller list to confuse the public, to misrepresent what people are really reading. So in its first week, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s Real Anthony Fauci sold, you know, something like 15 or 20,000 copies more than the number one New York Times bestseller, wow. which at the time was the 1619 Project, which, you know, take a wild guess, it was written by a New York Times writer about a project that was funded by the New York Times. <laughs> and, and they accepted every kind of advertising. In fact, they were giving free advertising for it in all of their newsletters and their morning emails. I mean, you could not read the New York Times or subscribe to any of their specialized periodicals without getting just inundated with ads for that book. And notwithstanding all of that, 
the real Anthony Fauci, you know, far outsold it and they just knocked it down on the bestseller list and, and made it number five. And then week after week, when it should have been number one or number two, it was number seven or number nine. So there's so much manipulation now. And anytime viewers see the word, you know, misinformation or disinformation or conspiracy theory, you know, they should recognize that these words are all weaponized to tell a specific narrative and and to, you know, give a point of view that may not be honest. Yeah, that is really important. Um, I am just holding my puppy so he doesn't make squeaky toy sounds. Uh, that's extraordinary. And what's what's especially extraordinary for people who, you know, are not publishing insiders is that what you just described is pretty easy to check because there's something called book scan, right? Which mm. will show that the real Anthony Fauci sold 10 or 15,000 more than the one that they're claiming is the number one book. Um, so I, I think they're thoroughly busted, right? They can't hide behind anything, right? Because those numbers are transparent. Well, even book scan was kind of, you know, acting strangely in the middle of the, you know, of, of that first full year of the so-called pandemic. So what what they were uh, describing to me when I called, so I, I asked them to have a Zoom call and I had some people from our distributor on the line and I tape recorded it and I had, you know, it was like seven or eight people because I wanted it to really be documented because it was not only the New York Times, there were some other places that report uh, numbers directly from NPD Bookscan that had not put it on the bestseller list. So I asked them why that was. And Bookscan said to me um, that there were reports of bulk sales. So I said, well, what is a, what's your definition of a, of a bulk sale? Because I, because I knew that all the big sales came from days that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was on a big podcast or on a TV show. And I followed it really, really closely so that he would be on a show and I can get minute by minute sales. So I'd see these huge spikes. And I was on that all the time because this was our biggest book for that, that month. Yeah. And so what they said was that their definition of a bulk sale includes if most of the books sold are from one customer. So I said, well, could that be Amazon? Right. And they said, yes, it could. And I said, well, don't you think it's likely that something like 95% of the sales of any sort of a controversial book are gonna be on Amazon because the independent bookstores refuse to carry it. And you know, Costco doesn't wanna carry controversial political books. And you know, Walmart sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. Target usually doesn't. So you're left with Amazon so that that is not a bulk sale. And they admitted on that conversation that they had to sort of investigate their own definition of what a bulk sale was. So, oh so the gosh. problem with bestseller lists is that there's no going back. But that was not the New York Times excuse because they don't subscribe to NPD Bookscan. So they don't use those numbers. They use the numbers directly from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, right. and all the big box stores. But if I understand you correctly, you're saying that even the New York Times figured out a way to disqualify books by saying it's a bulk sale, it's not kosher, but in fact, they're talking about Amazon or they could- No, no, what the, what the New York Times does is they just flat out curate their list right. and, they, and they take the rough numbers, but they play around with the order. And I've, and I've seen it just time after time. And you know, often if it's a con conservative book that they disagree with, they just won't put it on. I mean, there was a week about uh, six weeks ago where there was a book that sold 60,000 copies in a week mm -hmm. and it it did not make the New York Times bestseller list. Mm -hmm. And that's the book scan number. Oh, so the, the, the lowest number, the number 15 title that week was a book that sold 3,500 copies. So that more than 15 times, but you know, there was a specific reason for it. So it was a book by Alex Jones called The Great Reset, and they hate Alex Jones. Oh. So they were not going to put him on their bestseller list. If it sold a million copies, they did not care. So, you know, they are not what they appear to be. They're, they're an organization that is, you know, dedicated to telling a specific story. And if, if the facts contradict that narrative, 
they don't run the feds. And that's, you know, we've we've seen that with the times before, but it is it is really scary that the paper of record in this country can't be trusted to take an advertisement, to review the best-selling book in the country, to, you know, accurately reflect their bestseller list. And, and then even to run a hit piece against the author simultaneously with the publication of a book, you know, just the coordination of that shows you that they're sitting around having meetings, thinking about how they can convince the public that something that's happening really isn't happening. Uh, this is so tragic, especially because, I mean, these legacy news outlets are really running on the fumes of decades of having decent reputations for, for having integrity. And so most people who, uh, and the New York Times bestseller list is such a gateway to other important things that happen in a writer's life. And most people have no idea, and I didn't, I suspect it, but I didn't until you just explained it in gruesome detail, um, how much the New York Times bestseller list is gamed. Also, I do want to note if it makes, not that it's going to make you feel any better, but my previous book before uh, before The Bodies of Others um, had a chapter about a pandemic of typhus and cholera in the 19th century in Britain that led to the British state exploiting the pandemic to restrict people's liberties, invade their privacy, and um, adjudicate itself as master of the commons, which hadn't really existed prior to, mm -hmm. to that opportunity for the state to gain control over citizens. Um, and I, as you may recall, faced just unbelievable levels of attack for something that was nominally a book about a dead gay poet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with two mistakes in it. But it was like high levels. And, and the reason I mention this is that, um, and this was 2019 before the pandemic, but but not before planning for the pandemic, as it turns out from many um, sources we're finding now. Uh, this went all the way to the level of the New York Times, and they did a hit piece, which was not accurate, you know, when the literally when the book came out. And I remember being having this surreal conversation with the uh, David Kelly, the uh, corrections editor of the New York Times. The New York Times syndicates me, or they, you know, they did before I committed the crime of writing about a pandemic that led to the British state seizing control of everyone's lives. Um, you know, they, they, they've published me for decades, but David Kelly was like, we can't correct this. And I had the two most distinguished gay historians of the 19th century on the thread saying, Naomi's right, this is true. Wow. And he's like, we can't correct it, we can't correct it. So uh, my heart goes out to you. And then the book was pulped. So my, which has never happened in the history of, wow. you know, books um yeah that i'm aware of in modern times so uh my heart goes goes out to you for having you know people had people gunning for this book at the the highest levels nonetheless you triumphed so what were the other um challenges that you faced if any in bringing the real anthony fauci to audiences yeah so we had the same kinds of problems with amazon and with all of the other big tech platforms so what amazon is doing now and it, it seems like a really specific strategy. So what they did for a little while at the beginning, you know, in the late spring, early fall of 2020, and you saw it with Alex Berenson's books, with some of our books, um, where they just took books down. Right. And, 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 and then they got a lot of pushback. And so they clearly decided, and I would bet, although I, I, I don't really know for a fact, but I believe that they coordinated with various factions in the government, probably Dr. Fauci himself, maybe directly or you know not directly, but um, to do everything short of taking a, a book down, because taking a book down is such a dramatic public statement, and it's it's easy to fight against those kinds of statements. Right. But if you leave a book up, but you do what they did. So what they started off by doing is they put a little notation saying, you know, for information about COVID, go to the CDC website. Um, but what was really kind of fascinating there is that for the first couple of months, the Centers for Disease Control was spelled wrong. So it made me think, well, this isn't actually coming from the CDC. So it was, you know, with that typo, it was making me think that, there's some other government group that was coordinating 
with Amazon to, to, to censor things. So then I, I later found this document called Confronting Health Misinformation, which came from the Surgeon General in the fall of 2021. And that specifically, it's about 22 pages long. It has no real definition of what misinformation is. And it even says it's really hard to describe what it is. Mm -hmm. But then it has 21 and a half pages of all the steps that they're going to take. And so one of the steps that they describe is that they're going to go to big tech platforms and they're going to work with them on their product features. So that was sort of like a term that I had never heard before. And it was in quotations. So what I believe they mean by product features is that they were going to play around with the algorithms mm -hmm. to make it more difficult for people to find books that mm -hmm. they decide the public you know, shouldn't hear about, that that's a better move than to just take it down. So what they did was they made it so that with the real Anthony Fauci, to, to this day, it's never recommended. So anybody watching this knows that if you buy a kind of soap, you're then recommended 10 things that somehow connect to that, you know, has honey in it. People think, you know, you have a fetish for, you know, that kind of soap with honey in it. Maybe you'll, you'll like some other product that's like that. So with the real Anthony Fauci, you could like everything. You could go to the books written by all the people who gave blurbs to it. You will never get to that book with, without keywords from the title or from the author. That's the only way. So they played with the algorithms there. Mm -hmm. Then they took off at, at one point, they just took off all the likes for the positive reviews. So there was one review written by Dr. Mercola that had something like 7,500 likes and it was the number one re review. And they're you know, currently 21,000 reviews and they're almost all five star. Mm -hmm. But the ones that have a lot of likes on them, one of them has 2,500 likes is one of the very few negative ones. And you won't find any positive one that has more than 2,500. So they've been doing it periodically. Now it's kind of building up so that there was one that I was watching that had that was at something like 2,000 likes, went down to zero, then you know in, in the next month went back to 59, and then at some point it went back to zero. So they're monitoring really closely people who they think are a danger to a specific narrative. Right. And and this again, this is so tragic and so informative and so central, whether it's about this book or any book now or in the future, because people really don't understand that an algorithm is not a pure transparent thing. It can be gamed very easily uh, and you'll never know in ways that you describe and in many, many, many other ways. and. Um, people really have to understand that digital technology allows for forms of censorship that are much more insidious than traditional book burning because you can't right. see consequences. Right, because book book burnings, you can then have a have a counter rally. You can make your own statements, and it's clear to the public what's happening. Mm -hmm. Even when I start to describe likes and manipulation of things, I feel that people's eyes kind of glaze over because they're like, "Well, I can just go and buy it." So what's right. really happening? But what's happening is that your brain is being shaped and you're being pushed towards certain decisions. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there who are trying and to some extent succeeding in controlling what you do, what you think, what you right. read, what you watch. And, and it's subtle and it's gradual, Absolutely. but it's something that's really hard to, to fight against. Even Absolutely. really smart people out there, you know, are really convinced of things that objectively aren't true but you just can't get the truth. You just can't right. get the facts that would lead you to the honest conclusion. Right, absolutely. And I mean, just the three elements that you've described, a hit piece in the New York Times, um, kind of the stripping of likes on Amazon and the manipulation of the New York Times book review, all three of those are going to move the perception of Robert Kennedy Jr. and the real Anthony Fauci from what he literally was till he began, you know, working, talking about children's health defense related issues, right, which was a hero, the next generation, um, you know, welcome at every cocktail party sure. um, to to this kind of what my, you know, I always use the Deborah Wolf um, metric, which is my mom, an NPR watcher, smart lady, but, you know, the Deborah Wolf metric is, isn't there something kind of marginal about him now and how do i know that book is 
really true. And what you've just described, you know, on the New York Times bestseller list without a hit piece from the New York Times, just straight coverage and um, and and the likes not being gamed within three clicks, my mom would realize this is a popular book. People love it. This is a respected guy or at least a, a serious guy. Um, and, sure. you know, and, and he's selling a ton of books. But but no, they can um, even without running a piece saying this is a not credible person with a marginal publisher um, and people don't like his book, sure. they can create that impression. So, so but, but if you had power to to fight back and we've tried really hard, you know, there there are really good facts. And some of those are, you know, he was right about the Hudson River and he helped mm -hmm. clean it up and worked incredibly hard over many, many years, built a big team of people. Then, you know, mercury in, you know, childhood vaccines. He was, you know, right at the center of having mercury taken out of, of the mandatory vaccines and of telling the story that mercury could really harm children. Mm -hmm. And then he fought many, many big corporate battles against these big greedy corporations who are doing just nefarious things like Monsanto with Roundup. So he has a huge victory there. Then you also look at the fact that, you know, he was the 2010 environmental man of the year. So he's done all of these great things. He's got no conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's just an incredibly passionate and sincere person doing real research that, that doesn't really get done in this country. Right. Because research is, is pretty much all corrupted. I mean, to a, such a great extent, it's, it's just about where the money comes from, what people are trying to, to prove. So, you know, even when you look at the real facts here and you look at, at some of the things that were going on, so many of the hit pieces that were lined up, not only towards, you know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., but, you know, Dr. Mercola, you, many, many other, other people, many really well-respected people, Many of the things they were saying at the time was, well, this person claims that you can still get COVID with a vaccine. So they need to be totally deplatformed, you know, for the safety of the American public. Or they were saying, oh, well, it's possible that uh, COVID could still be spread by somebody who got the vaccine. And at that moment, it was real heresy. But the New York Times and all of the other newspapers and magazines and websites who deplatformed all of these people and who who censored them in every way, who vilified them, they haven't come back and said, oh, actually, they were right about this. They were right about that. They were right about that. Mm -hmm. They're they're still, they still have the same narrative, even though anybody can now have access to those general facts that, you know, vaccines haven't worked as in, intended. It, it might be much, much worse than that, but it's perfectly clear mm -hmm. that they did not work as they were intended and as we were promised right. by a president, by the most powerful health official in the country, by newscasters far and wide. So, you know, what's happened is we've been lied to, but the propaganda is so strong and the censorship is so strong that, you know, most people still don't even know. That's true. Well, let's talk about your role now as publisher of Skyhorse. How did you become publisher of Skyhorse? I know it's a family business. And what does it mean to you that you're one of the, honestly, I would say less than half a dozen remaining independent publishers in the United States? What's that legacy about? Yeah, so I, I joined my father's publishing company. It was called the Lions Press uh, about 30 years ago. And I, and I helped him run that. Then I became publisher of that. And then we sold that to another publishing company. And then I started Skyhorse uh, in 2006. And so we've, you know, like you said before, we've published more than 10,000 books. And I, and I first met Bobby Kennedy, I think it was in around uh, 2012. And we published his book, Thimerosal, Let the Science Speak. And we published many other kind of controversial books, mainly because at the time we had the the opportunity to, and, and I had some, some connection to each, each type of book and then got, you know, more involved as, as the years went by. I'm not sure if that totally answers your question, but, uh, but it was sort of a gradual process. I guess I'd like to know, I mean, you're taking risks that Random House and Simon & Schuster no longer take. 
um, you're publishing people. I mean, publishing someone like RFK Jr. There's a reason other publishers are not publishing people like us. Um, you know why why we're going to independent presses, uh, and and you know you've described some of them. It's difficult to get on the list. It's difficult to stay on the list. It's difficult to get distribution in some places. You get shadow banned. So why go to all the trouble of being an independent publisher publishing books that have um, enemies? Basically, what's the purpose of being? an independent publisher standing up for, you know, against censorship, basically, in a time like this? Sure. I mean, many people have asked me, you know, whether I'm afraid of the consequences of publishing all these types of books. And and I and I feel like, like, maybe, you know, one of the worst things that could happen to a publisher is that you get a major hit piece written. And Vanity Fair wrote a really long, rambling hit piece uh, you know, mentioning book after book that we had of published course. that I, that of, yeah. of ours that I guess they wished we, we, we hadn't published. And they, and they spent a lot of time and a lot of money on it. And I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, sure. It's, it really is a badge of honor that, that they would spend that much time. And, and I was, I was fascinated by it because I, I knew for sure that none of Vanity Fair's uh, readers knew who I was, knew who Sky Horse was. Mm -hmm. Uh, though, though they had heard of some of our books. And, uh, but what was fascinating was how intense their response was. And my feeling is that I'm much more afraid of living in a country, you know, where voices can't be heard, where there's censorship to such an extreme degree, where you can turn on the television and, and hear lies, where the government is lying to you and telling you that they're trying to protect you from other people who are lying. You know, all of those kinds of things I think are so ugly that I wouldn't want to be a publisher if I was going to shy away from taking those kinds of risks. So I think that the much bigger risk is just to kind of give up, to give up on your own life, on your fellow country people. Mm -hmm. The, you know, and, and democracy itself and freedom of speech itself. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that, you know, that's the reason to do it, that more people ought to do it. They're going to feel better about themselves when they take those kinds of risks because they're taking the ultimate risk when they commit censorship, when they mm -hmm. participate in, in, in fraud, whether it's government fraud or, or corporate fraud, you know, that's the kind of risk that just rots your soul. And I think, you know, that's the real risk. I'm not taking any risk. I'm doing something that I'm proud of. And that's not risky. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully well put. I so applaud you. Um, well, let's go to my last couple of questions, if I may. I'd like to know, and this is partly just kind of my own sad, sentimental query, but I'd like to know what's the mood of people in New York in conventional publishing these days? Like how do they feel good about themselves? And do you think that the world, the New York elite world that, you know, we both know and, and are to some extent have been part of, I don't know to what extent you still are, I'm completely ejected, but um, you know, will that ever, will those people ever say they're sorry and wrong that's number one and number two is is it a good business like are alternative news sources alternative publishers who do take the risk of publishing the truth is it a booming sector it seems to be so both of those questions in in the order you prefer yeah i mean i think that the kind of mainstream new york publishing field i mean i i think to some extent people are ashamed of what they've done not, not just during the COVID time, but the whole sort of cancel culture period where, you know, they were heads of, of some of the big companies that canceled a book after sort of saying that they wouldn't cancel it. You know, they gave speeches saying, you know, they recognized people didn't want them to publish this, but that they really liked the book and wanted to do it. And then they canceled it anyway, you know, so that there's a lot of sort of ugliness there that I think people are very clear of. And, and some of those kinds of people have actually quit publishing. Hmm. Uh, you know, they've, they've, they've just left and said they don't, they don't want to be part of it. Have um, you a name or two you might drop there or rather not? Well, I mean, I would, I would say somebody like, um, 
you know, I'm not sure how he would feel about me mentioning him, but uh, John Sargent, hmm. who, uh, you know, used to run Mc, Macmillan. Hmm. Uh, I don't really know the inside story, but I, but I have a feeling that there was some sort of, you know, disagreement on the issue of freedom of speech, gotcha. on the issue of having a diversity of ideas in their publishing program, you know, that there's just clearly not enough backbone in the publishing field now. And he's somebody who definitely had backbone and was, you know, was was feeling some pressure. So I think after having run one of the big five publishing companies for decades, he was from a book publishing family, his uh, family had founded Doubleday. Wow. Uh, I, I believe, though I don't know, that uh, that that he had just, you know, gotten to the point where he didn't want any more of it. Mm. But I have found sort of quietly uh, many people in the publishing field, you know, maybe they're just saying it to me because they don't know what else to say. But they say, well, I disagree with many of the books that that you published, but I applaud your your bravery in publishing these kinds of books in this kind of an environment where nobody else will. Mm -hmm. and, and And some of them seem to get that the decision should be in the marketplace of ideas, you know, like even if it was the morally right thing to cancel and censor, you know, these awful people, let's, let's just say for a second that, that that was doing sort of a public service to, to readers, you know, the question is always, well, how would you decide and who would get to decide? And that's why we need those decisions to be made by the general public, you know, in the sense that if you don't want to read a book, you don't have to. If you've read a bunch of hit pieces against somebody and, and you believe it and, and you've had enough, then then you you can just not read that. Right. But to say that nobody else should be allowed to read it or hear those ideas, you know, censorship is not about somebody really being powerful. Censorship is a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. If if you have a better idea, if you have a better argument. You don't need censorship. I you can just that. convince people, right? And if you convince people, it, it really lasts. And that's that that really can change the world. Mm -hmm. So even as a as a practical issue, if you really want to stomp out a bad idea, you should go at it head on. I mean, if Dr. Fauci really believed that he could out debate Robert F. Kennedy Jr about the allegations of corruption in the real Anthony Fauci, why wouldn't he do that? He had all the power to do that. He could have chosen the venue. He could have brought a dozen scientists with him. He could have publicized it. I mean, he had millions of dollars at his disposal. Mm -hmm. Every platform, every commentator would have skewed it towards him. I mean, he, he had every tool in his favor, but he was still afraid to face the allegations. So the only thing that he could do was to try to silence the opposition. And that ought to make the American public think, well, maybe he really is corrupt. Maybe these allegations of financial entanglements, of, of all these horrid things that have actually led to more people dying than would have had to die, mm -hmm. you know, which is, is the worst possible thing you can do in this world. I mean, right. if anybody ought to be vilified, it's somebody who would do those kinds of things. So if he could protect himself, why not do it? Absolutely. Well, and good. the answer has to be that he just couldn't do it, that he believed that he couldn't convince people. And he was afraid that if he was on a national stage with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., that the American public would have believed Robert F. Kennedy Jr. instead of him. Yeah. I mean, well put to say um, censorship is a sign of weakness. That's a that's a phrase for the ages. So last last question, thank you. Um, are, are alternative sources of books and media doing well in your view? Is it a bad business to censor? Yeah, so I think that what's happened, you know, in the last couple of years is that you've gone from a point where a very small percentage of the population had this feeling that things weren't quite right, that they were being steered towards certain things, that they were being prevented from seeing, reading, watching things. But what's happened is now that tens of millions of people recognize that they've been lied to, that they've been manipulated, that they've been, been sort of subjected to a level of propaganda that's, you know, unprecedented in the history of the world. 
you know, that there've never been these sort of situations where a bot can be instructed to search and destroy certain words, certain ideas anywhere on the internet, even in private messages. Right. I mean, that's such an incredible power. Those are tools that have nobody has, no dictator in the history of mankind has had that kind of power. Mm -hmm. So I think the amazing thing and the, and the good that's coming of this is that millions and millions of people recognize it and they're flocking to alternative media sites. They're flocking to some of the kinds of books we've published, to some of the kinds of books that you've written. And they're seeing that there are other arguments out there and they're open to them. And they're seeing, I was lied to, I was tricked, I was coerced, and I just don't want it anymore. Beautiful. Uh, well, I, that's just such a ringing conclusion. What can people do to help you? And what can people do to help both the book and the movie of the real Anthony Fauci get out into the world in spite of all of this opposition? Yeah, so I would recommend that everybody watching this go to the real Anthony Fauci movie.com. And I think, you know, I'm not going to ask people to do anything else. I think they should go there. It's still free. They should download it. Um, the uh, part two of it is free for the next three days. And I think part one is due for three or four days more. So they should go there. They should watch part one, watch part two. And they should really think about whether they believe the things that are said there. Because it's such an incredible story. And the people telling it, and and you're you're in it too. So the you know the people telling this story are so credible, so sincere. So the the information is so well researched that I think just taking that step to watch it, whether you believe that you will agree with it or whether you feel like you're going to hate it, you know, test yourself because if your ideas are really strong, they can withstand listening to people who you disagree with. That's how you learn whether your ideas are really good ideas or are really strong, you know, that they can take this challenge. So that's what the movie is. It's a challenge to your, to your view of the world. So watch that. Maybe it makes you think what you already think stronger, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe it starts to change you just a little bit. Fantastic. Absolutely seconded. And people, because uh, not everyone just wants to watch the movie, that'll send many people back to the book. They can find the real Anthony Fauci at skyhorsepublishing.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Lyons. And thank you for standing up for the right of people to read and to share ideas. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. It's Naomi Wolf of Daily Clout. And I am asking you to please, uh, if you like the video you just saw, uh, support us, become a member, donate. Um, you can send checks to P.O. Box 24, Millerton, New York, one two five four six or go to daily clout d-a-i-l-y-c-l-o-u-t become a member or donate thank you so much for your support every penny goes for paying our hard-working staff paying hosting costs and paying our lawyers um, who have been uh, leading the fight to keep you safe and free to keep the constitution safe and to keep you free thank you so much